we knew that we had to have a rich learning environment for the adults in the setting if we were going to have a robust learning environment for the kids. This is High Tech High Unboxed. I'm Alec Patton, and that was the voice of Rob Reardon, co-founder of High Tech High, as well as the High Tech High Graduate School of Education, and High Tech High's former Emperor of Rigor. This is our second fireside chat with Rob and Caleb Rashad, High Tech High's interim CEO. And today we're talking about how the adults learn at High Tech High. Let's get right into it. Fireside chat number two, adult learning at High Tech High. Let's get into the ancient history. Take us back, Rob. <laughs> so the question being, you know, why did we start a graduate school of education and how did, how did we start it and so on? When we opened High Tech High in 2000, we opened with maybe 12 to 14 teachers. And we knew that no matter how much these new teachers, to, new to High Tech High teachers, uh, bought into project-based learning, most of them would never have experienced it themselves as learners. So we knew that we had to have a rich learning environment for the adults in the setting if we were going to have a robust learning environment for the kids. And the way we structured that was that we built a schedule where the adults, all of the adults, came to school an hour before the kids arrived every day for meetings. And they engaged in these meetings in conversations about kids, curriculum, issues the school was facing, and questions in their own practice. And what we saw over the first year was a lot of, uh, because everyone was new to a kind of untracked, heterogeneous situation in their classrooms, even the veteran teachers had stuff that they were thinking about and wondering about just as the new teachers did. So there was a lot of mutual focus in these conversations. How do we do projects with a group of kids who are very different in terms of where they're coming from and so forth? And what should projects look like anyway? And so what we saw was that as a result of these morning conversations, many of our new teachers really made great strides in their comfort in the classroom, in their relationship with kids, in their, in their ability to design and execute projects with kids. So we were thinking at the same time that we knew that some of our teachers were coming from industry, for example. Some of them had PhDs. They were not qualified to teach in public school. In other words, they had to go to school at night and pay money to learn to teach in ways that we didn't necessarily want them to be teaching. And so we applied to the state of California to run a district internship program where we could hire teachers, put them in the classroom, and at the same time give them classroom work towards the teacher credential. Uh, it took us a couple of years to get authorized to do that, but we got authorized so that we then were running an internship program where we could hire people, put them in the classroom, give them coursework, and give them mentors. And over the course of a couple of years, they would have their preliminary credential at no cost to them. And over the four years, they could get a clear California credential through our internship program. As we were doing that, I think we started that somewhere around 2003, maybe even a little earlier. But as we were doing that, other schools in the area, some charter and some district schools, contacted us and said, hey, will you do this for our teachers? And we thought we could not. We thought it was only for our own teachers. We learned later we could do it uh, through a memorandum of understanding for teachers from elsewhere. But given that misunderstanding, we said, well, if we want to do that kind of work beyond high tech high, we need to open a graduate school. And we applied to do a graduate school of education right in the K-12 environment. We got authorization fairly quickly to do that. And we opened in 2007 with master's programs in teacher leadership and school leadership. And that later became simply a, a master's in education leadership. But as we went along, we were then able, we started with people from our own orbit, from the high tech high organization, and then opened it up to outsiders. We did the graduate school for a couple of reasons. 
One is that we wanted to build capacity within our own organization, a leadership capacity. And the second was that we did want to use the graduate school kind of as an engine of dissemination of high-tech high vision and principles and practices. So that's why we did it. And then it grew, of course, as we went along. It took us eight years to be accredited by the uh, Western States Association, the accrediting association, partly because it took them a while to figure out why anyone would want to have a graduate school of education in a K-12 environment. (laughs) Um, In fact, during their first visit, their first question was, where's your building? And we said, well, we don't have a building. We occupy the uh, K-12 buildings in this organization in the afternoons and evenings when the kids aren't here. And they had a lot of trouble uh, with that. None of the initial accreditors in the visiting committee, there was a group of three or four, were from education schools. They were all from uh, departments in universities um, around. So we didn't have that kind of connection in the beginning either. But anyway, after seven or eight years, and there were things we learned too about being a graduate school uh, through our association with WASC. But anyway, in 2015, in June of 2015, we finally were fully accredited as a graduate school of education. I would say a couple of more things, and then, Caleb, you can chime in. Sure, sure. There were a couple of things that we really wanted to do in this graduate school. One is that we wanted to do things with the teachers who were in our programs that they could do the next day in their classrooms. So there was this kind of symmetry and parallelism that we were after. We wanted our pedagogy in the graduate school to exemplify what we wanted our teachers to do and what we were urging teachers from elsewhere to do. So that included things like keeping journals, included things like designing projects using protocols, and we leaned heavily on the protocols from the School Reform Initiative around project tuning, around dilemmas of practice, and around looking at student work. That symmetry of practice was very important to us. And of course, it was very important to us to link theory and practice in Mm -hmm. one program. Mm -hmm. Larry and I had both taught at Harvard in the graduate school. I had been uh, responsible for a while for the practicum seminar, seminar for Harvard's student teachers. One year, we had about 100 student teachers in this and, and we, they were with teaching fellows and all that. We had pract- a practicum seminar. And our frustration was that we were engaging these prospective teachers in progressive pedagogy. And then they would go out into their sites for their student teaching. And they would come back and say, well, we've been told that we're not to do that here in, in my practicum site. So there was this disconnect uh, between theory and practice. Not always, not everywhere, but but frequently a disconnect between theory and practice. Um, and one of our aims in our Graduate School of Education was to really close that gap and to link uh, theory and practice together. For a while, we were saying, you know, m- most schools, uh, ed schools are 80% theory and 20% practice. We're 20% theory, 80% practice. That did not go over well with, our, with WASP. <laughs> Uh, so, so we ended up, we had learned to say, we are 100% theory in practice. And that's been our aim all the way through. Oh, my goodness. Can I, can I just jump in there? There's so, there's so much richness in what you just described. And I, and I, as a learner, and maybe for those, you know, who may be listening to this now or in the future, I'm, I would love to like circle back to something you started, you said at the very beginning about the rich learning environments for the adults. Yeah. And I, both in theory and practice in the, in the sense of 100% theory and practice, what practices or principles given like that sense of symmetry that you were describing later on? Yeah. What are the principles and practices that you would imagine would be important in creating these rich learning environments for the adults that we hope to see for the young people? Yeah. In the morning meetings of teachers, 
or in our classes in the GSE and in our classes in what still constitutes an internship program, we want people to do a lot of reflection on their own trajectory, their own background, their own learning experiences, uh, and so on. For example, we want all of these, the adults in our setting, to have an opportunity to reflect on uh, significant learning. What is significant learning Mm -hmm. in your experience as a learner? Mm -hmm. What do you know about significant learning from your uh, experience as a learner? And we like to put people in small groups to to kind of write a little bit about that, then share with each other. They're sharing stories with each other and building community thereby. But they're also, we ask them to, from these stories, extract the elements of significant learning and to think about what would a place look like where significant learning is going on all the time. What will my classroom look like as a place of significant learning? And so what we come up with and what they come up with as they extract the elements from their stories are things like uh, there were opportunities to reflect and think about. It was something I was interested in. The teacher believed in me. There was an important audience for the work. The work was valuable in the community in some way. Uh, So there are things that people say based on their own experience as learners that really do connect with our design principles. So to your question, Caleb, what would it look like? It starts with that kind of reflection about what is significant learning, but it situates that conversation in a kind of collaborative conversation. And we then ask our adult learners also to present their work, to bring in some student work for colleagues to look at and respond to and help analyze, help think about, and so on. So we engage in reflection, we engage in uh, dialogue, and our classes uh, in the in the graduate school are dialogical. Uh, my hope is that our morning meetings of teachers in the hour before kids come to school remain dialogical, and they are collaborative, all with the aim of getting better at what we do. In case anyone doesn't know what dialogical means, can you give a... Yeah, so dialogical means that we, we talk about things. If there's a question before us, for example, here's this group of 10th graders, I'm teaching them humanities, what would be some good projects? We look at samples of good projects and people weigh in with advice about what might be a good project, what worked for me, what was a barrier for me, and so on, so that we're not thinking and working and designing in isolation. Uh, We're engaging in a grand conversation about the work uh, with each other as we go along. There's so much richness in that. If I can like just connect a couple of things from the beginning to the end, this very simple yet profound seductive move, I might call it, when you look, thinking about designing the adult learning and sourcing from within the learners, <laughs> their lived experiences or their shared experiences to discern or distill what might be some key principles for learning as you were starting to describe them. That sort of like shift from interrogation or wondering about what is already within you and using questions to get at that versus what typically happens in adult learning environments where there is this sort of learning that's imposed upon you and then asked to sort of regurgitate in some way. Yeah. And and it takes it takes us to the to the symmetry again. Yeah. Because we're we're doing this with the adults right. and the expectation that they will do the same kind of dialog- dialogical work with their students. We had a student in our graduate school, a high tech middle school teacher. Quick note, that teacher was Bobby Shaddix, who's also the person who convinced me I should become a teacher. He now teaches at King Middle School in Portland, Maine. We we engaged in those kinds of conversations about significant learning and project design and so forth. And he decided that he wanted to engage his students in co-designing a project. And so he went into his, with his teaching partner. Shout out to Bobby's teaching partner, Ali Wong. 
went into his classroom the first day and had had post-it notes on all the tables and said to the kids, write down on post-it notes all of your questions about yourself and the world. And we're going to build our curriculum for the next mm-hmm. three months yep. on your questions. So the kids wrote their questions down furiously and on post-it notes, and they put them up on the whiteboard. And then they started, over, over three or four days, they started moving the post-it notes around, categorizing them, talking and so forth about where we should go together with all of these questions. And they came up with the theme for the next three months of the course in humanities and math science, which was the end. This is sixth graders, the end of the world. Three months later, they had an evening exhibition where they presented their book, The End of the World Uncovered, which talked about their explorations in groups of the various ways the world might end, tsunami, plague, war, famine, meteorite, you know, all the different possibilities. So they were they were standing before their work as experts to talk about the ways the world might end and what we might do it and to talk about their process, mm-hmm. what they did by way of research into these questions. But it all started with student questions. And of course, as they did that work, the teachers were able to crosswalk the work to the California standards and find that they were in fact addressing the California standards in English, social studies, math, and science as they were doing the work. So it was a very inductive, dialogical, Mm -hmm. and it was collaborative. It was engaging the students as Mm co-designers. That to me is a quintessential example of that kind of dialogical work honoring the questions and the experience of the students and putting it out to the world. I love that so much. In my experience in working with a variety of different schools where I've been in some position, role position or authority, the opportunity to create spaces where adults can learn and do the kind of learning that is dialogical is so profound, especially in places that are deprived of opportunities to think, to reflect with each other about yourself, about our work, about our relationships, who we are, what do we want to create for our young people? How do we want to be of service to our community? These sort of questions remind me that Paulo Freire like laid out these sort of like, I think he called them foundations or fundamentals of like dialogue. And I'm, uh, two of them right now come into mind for me. One is about like humility. <laughs> yeah. The sense that you might not know <laughs> everything. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, dialogue, as he described, can't exist without some humbling yeah. of oneself, a recognition of your limited scope of understanding, no matter who you might be. I think that's part one. The second thing that stands out to me is this, this sense of like, he called it love as a fundamental tenet of that true dialogue. It is this sort of willingness and curiosity to love the world, to love people, to wonder about them. So I think he, he didn't, I mean, he said a lot of things about love, but I think what he was kind of pointing to, especially tied to this question of humility, is about curiosity, about wondering about oneself, our origins, what we know, how we want to be with each other and who we might want to become. Like every time we in school communities where we're doing these sort of adult learning experiences and people are asked to unpack their like lived experience, sometimes in insignificant learning and impacts on their school lives that shaped who they are today. It's always rich with emotional textures. Yeah. And it's humbling to watch people, whether it's with another person or in a smaller group, identify those areas of pain and also those areas of promise. Yeah. There's like a lot of riches that that really comes out of that. Yeah. I think that, and of course, all of this cuts against the grain. That's right. In most schools and most systems, we teach subjects and students need to learn the subjects and they're tested on the subjects. And very often their lived experience is viewed as as a distraction. Right, right. And we try to run counter to that that kind of uh, 
what Saracen would call the existing regularity of school and all the stuff around testing and even teacher credentialing and the organization of the curriculum by subjects uh, and so on. What you're talking about, Caleb, in terms of dialogue and lived experience and and love runs counter to uh, to conventional schoolings. So as we do this work, we bump into those conventional assumptions and practices all the time. For example, when as we've we've tried to have our teachers uh, who may have a degree in English, for example, teach humanities and teach projects that engage kids, partly so that if they're a humanities teacher teaching twice as long, like English and social studies, their load is cut in half of, of students. So instead of maybe 112 students, a high-tech high teacher who's teaching English and social studies together is teaching 56 uh, students, which gives teachers more leverage, and it allows us to group students so that the same, so the two teachers have the same students for most of the time. Right. That is totally counter to the way schools operate, where they function around choice and choose kids choose all different kinds of things. So no teacher has a group of students that is identical with the students of another teacher. So it's impossible for them to collaborate on projects. Part of our structural aim was to make it possible for teachers to collaborate on projects because they share the same kids. Yeah, I would just like bang on that too. Just say like, I mean, all this to me, all this work is, you know, in service of, trying to humanize learning, trying to humanize what has been generally a dehumanizing experience yeah. for many communities, especially in the continental United States or mostly by almost any imperial uh, empire Yeah, about the role that education is to take is to subjugate and to uh, narrowly define like what is appropriate, what is education worthy and to discount any other like funds of knowledge or epistemologies or ways of being beyond the Western canon. And so I think the more that we are able to, with adults, bring this back to the adults, to support them in recognizing, oh, no, 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 no. You actually, you, your people actually have lots of important experiences to bring in terms of learning and when we do that with you as adults, it supports them in doing it with young people. And I just want to, I want to add something. Go ahead. It's not just about sharing the kids. It's about that shared time that just, you end up with four hours yeah. that the kids are going to be with one teacher or another. And so you can go off campus, you can go do things. You can have 40 kids go off campus and 10 kids stay on campus. You can have 10 kids go off campus and 40 kids stay on campus. Yeah, There's this incredible amount of flexibility. You don't have to talk to 15 different teachers to find out if your kids can all go somewhere. Right, right. We've had teachers do unbelievable work in astronomy, for example. Uh, so where's that? In, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the sequence, in the yeah. science sequence. Yeah. I mean, we've had, as, as Caleb, as you know, four young women at High Tech I wrote an article for the Journal of Double Star Observation yep. where they discussed their findings that what a British astronomer had identified as a trinary system in 1861 was actually a binary system. And they traced what must have been his thinking, what he must have seen. Um, in order to come to that conclusion about, anyway, that happened outside of school. Uh, it happened in an astronomy club, but wow, why is this not inside the school and inside our curriculum? That's the kind of question we're asking ourselves as, as we're encouraging teachers to do projects that connect with kids' lives and connect with the world. To me, like that is like the most exciting part of at least from a school leader point of view, is you know designing adult learning that allows everyone to practice elements of the craft and get better with that craft over time for sure. But then there's also like recognizing like each one of them 
has like very diverse sets of interests and skills and taste and talents. Yeah. And like, like creating a sort of permission architecture that allows people to like explore those things. Cause yeah. when they do, they bring those things back with them. Yeah. And it is such a rich benefit to the kids. Here's an example. So we had, uh, I think it was a 10th grade teacher at the time, Rusty Walker uh, was his name. He and Jeff Lohman worked on a project that was about uh, colonizing Mars. Oh, Yeah, so everyone, of course, in our school is like learning through projects and, and that sort of thing. So we learn about the craft of that. Yes, no doubt. And, you know, Rusty comes to me and he's like, Caleb, guess what's happening at the San Diego Convention Center? There is a NASA conference. Ooh. Can I go? I'm like, absolutely. He went to th this professional grade learning experience with other NASA uh, astronauts, engineers, scientists, government officials, etc., and came back heart on fire. And you could see it in the work with the young people. Yeah. So to me, I think, you know, this, this sort of double helix of like, making sure everyone on one strand gets everything we all should be getting. But the other strand is like, what do you need and what are you massively fascinated in the world and how can we create ways for you to pursue that thing that like lights the teacher on fire yeah and that fire is translated to, yeah. to, to students and when you pursue that thing it will connect with everything else yes 100 percent. so good it's not just an isolated thing over here it connects with everything um, and then and then how about this how about adults being so excited about learning yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, I want to bring it to someone and show, oh, can I show you this? Look, yeah. this thing is happening. That thing is happening. It's unbelievable. Yeah, you mentioned uh, encouraging teachers to pursue their interests and passions and so on. I don't know if, it, if, if people still do it in our adult sessions and so forth, but early on, uh, when we would, one of the exercises we would do with our, with our teachers would be the significant learning exercise that I've already talked yeah. about. The second one would be a project design exercise. We would put people in maybe a group of six, and we'd say, okay, this was like one of our early, early sessions. Introduce yourselves and describe uh, to, for the group a passion or interest that you have. And then the task of the group is design a unit or project that incorporates the interests of every member of the group. Ooh. That would be the challenge. And people mm -hmm. would come up with these incredible uh, project designs and present them to the larger group. Again, doing presentations of learning, which we're going to, they're going to be asking their kids to do later on. But the notion that we can proceed from our interests and our questions and so forth was something that we tried to infuse uh, very early on in, in our uh, in our work with with adults. Hey, Rob, can I ask you a question? Yeah. You may or may not remember this. Way back when I first came to High Tech High as part of a group from England. Yeah. We all did, gave presentations of learning. Yeah. And you had these instructions. And one of your instructions was, I think it was that it, it had to have a bit of magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Was that it? Is that what you say? Is that the wording? What what, what did you say? I think uh, it, I'm trying to remember, but I think I think probably if, if you were in groups and the groups were presenting, correct? Yeah. So the group had to present uh, present its magic name. So you had you had to you had to name yourself as a group, and but it had to be a magic name. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember somebody like took a piece of chart paper and like dipped it in tea to make it look like it was aged and ancient. Uh -huh. It was, yeah, it was yeah. fun. It was right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, amazing stuff that people come up with when you ask them to do design. And, you know, not simply designing projects from interest, but there are various kinds of rapid design projects that you can do or exercises that you can do around creating projects. And interestingly, 
when people do it, you know, you, you do it in 20 minutes or so, they often end up with things that actually become later on, they work on them, they refine them, and so they become full-blown projects. But the notion of sitting down and just firing some stuff out um, that you think um, there's, there's something essential about it, something you could be interested in, something you think kids might be interested in, you have an idea for a product or, or a performance and for a venue, um, just starting with that. And then you can begin to other, ask other questions like, okay, how are we going to um, meet the needs of all students? Here, the the equity issue. How are we gonna How are we gonna uh, address the needs of all all the students in the class as we're doing this? How are we gonna engage student interests and all all of the those other questions that you can that you can ask as you go along? Can you guys speak a little bit to the role of fun in adult learning? <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yes. Cue it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's all, over to you, Caleb. Oh, man. I, hey, how about this? I, I think this is the magic. It is, uh, as, you know, that we we're just talking about. There is something about, you know, the sort of rote tactic of like, here's what you're going to learn. Here's how we're going to know you learned it. Here's what you're going to show me. Th that whole thing. I mean, you want to like take the mysterious, joyful, opportunity to discover something out of it, lay that whole track down. On the other hand, if you start like with a, what I would call a, the Goldilocks question that uh, is a little philosophical, a little concrete, and somewhere in the middle, there is something worth pursuing that people get an opportunity to discover for themselves, that fun can come in in lots of different ways. Because uh, not all of it, quote, is fun, but there should be, to me, a sense of possibility of discovering something that not to the group is not yet known. And that means that sometimes you're going to like run up against things that are challenging or difficult. You have to persevere through, but in pursuing important purposeful questions, there is this sort of magic that gets released, this sort of social alchemy, even if it doesn't like, result in the thing you had initially hoped for, the pursuit of that thing and doing that thing together, especially with the, you know, the opportunities to engage in dialogue and discourse about the thing, whatever it is you're working on, ourselves um, as people pursuing this question, I think adults, especially when it comes to adult learning, want opportunities to play. And so the design of the adult learning experience well, it can be a little tacky in my mind to like say, you're going to have fun today, <laughs> you know, but rather like, what is the thing worth pursuing? And then how do we pursue that thing and tie opportunities for, for joy, for purpose within it and throughout it? It is to me like what attracted me to High Tech High is watching adults do these sort of things. Here's an example. In the spring every year, here in this building, I'm in Building 49 right now, the original High Tech High. And um, every year in the spring, we would do these spark sessions where teachers like Margaret Egler and Lisa Griffin would lead our entire like 30, 40, 40 person staff of teachers into ideation modes about upcoming projects. And so... Um, Part of that ideation, which took probably three to four sessions over about three months for them to kind of get all the ideas out before making any decisions on anything, they would sometimes have to act out different parts of, of uh, their projects. And so one of the projects that was at the time that they were coming up with was the Semester Upstream project. So three or four teachers grabbed like right here in the middle of the school, grabbed paddle boards, they grabbed life jackets, and they just started like acting like they were canoeing up the Colorado River. And there's no way any one person could have planned what kind of creative expression would come out of that. But there's always opportunities 
when you have the lens of what are some ways by which people can show us their ideas? And it was marvelous to see all of our 40 some odd teachers here acting out in different kinds of ways, um, their early project prototypes. So you can take, and this, is, this is my last point, you can take a really equity focused, hopeful, inspiring way of learning, like learning through projects and make it absolutely boring. <laughs> that can happen. Yeah. Okay. And you checked all the boxes. I launched a project. I, you know, I did the whole thing. Right. And you can take, you can like completely deconstruct PBL and, um, and do it in a way that still has the common element and bring so much life, so much life into like the experience, both in its creation in its execution, in its reflection. And so I think fun is a nice like, moniker, but like there is something deeper a- around th- this whole piece around joy for me when it comes to like designing adult learning. Yeah, I've seen you do some of that role play stuff, Caleb, with uh, in, uh, in beginning of the year meetings, for example, and so forth. I mean, it's just a lot of fun. It's just having a lot of fun together. Um, yeah, I mean, it takes a little extra work, but like I've also been in places um, before, I came, before I came to High Tech High, where the adult learning was absolutely boring. <laughs> and yeah. the, the level of engagement was like, you know, you know about like how you moved, how many people up in the kids raised their hands. And, you know, uh, slant, for example, is another quote, engagement activity. These things are like soulless, man. Yeah. They yeah. are mechanistic, like show me with your body that you're quote, engaged. But rather this kind of thing about fun, in my estimation, I would love to hear Rob's take uh, being the emperor of rigor here. But when I think about fun, it is something that is like you create the conditions by which people have opportunity to creatively express something within themselves in a way that that is meaningful to them and to the group that they're learning with. Yeah, so uh, song and dance. I've seen kids dance meiosis. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's lots of ways that, not only around content, but also around the classroom routines. Ooh. I mean, we have to take attendance in the morning, right, for our revenue and this and that and so forth. Well, you can make the, the taking of attendance a really fun thing to do, one way or another. You know, uh, uh, lots of ways engaging kids in being responsible for the warm up in a class. And that's always a lot of fun. There are just lots of ways to do it. But to me, Alec, back to your question around fun. Yeah, some of it's about fun and it needs to be fun. But I think so much of it is about dialogue and getting a chance to speak, getting getting your questions out there and feeling that you are heard and that you belong and that you're part of this. Um, And so... That's what we're after yeah. at High Tech High for, for the adults and the kids, both. Caleb, right at the start, you were talking about collegial relationships. Yeah. Yes, I was. Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Just giving you space. Ah, you want me to like elaborate on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Caleb, usually you don't need the invitation. <laughs> I was trying to be patient. I was giving you space. Yo, I mean, at one time, you know, I used to think it was just about creativity and innovation. And I used to think it was just about projects. And what I am understanding maybe perhaps more now, that it has always been about, at least in part, the adult to adult relationship, uh, relationships with each other. And when done well, it can help to produce a sort of trust rich environment in which teachers can share their craft with other teachers. I once had a teacher way wiser than me, John Santos, who once said to me, Caleb, if we are waiting for you to give us all feedback to get better, you are going to be the bottleneck to our improvement. And that resonated with me so deeply. And so out of that sort of conversation, by the way, underscore like his and maybe the group's 
wanting to learn and wanting to get better and improve at their craft. We created like all different kinds of ways by which teachers could learn from other teachers about this craft. And I'm really thankful to him and to all the teachers who wanted to improve, who wanted to grow, who wanted to develop, and they want to do that together. And so to me, a thing that is a critical resource for improvement, a critical resource for getting better, for developing, especially among adults and adults with young people, is the extent to which they are willing to take risks with one another, to grow together, to share their craft together, to share what they've failed at and seek guidance and feedback from each other. It's a powerful thing to watch a group of adults who have high levels of trust and a commitment to the craft in service of young people. That collegial pedagogy piece, I think, is very important. And I worry about it all the time. Part of this has to do with how do you bring new teachers into the setting? And early on, what we always aimed to do during our new teacher odyssey was to have veteran teachers come in uh, and share with the new teachers in small groups projects that they were working on and ask for help in the design. So the message being you as a new teacher are, are a full member of the dialogue about teaching and learning here. And then we, we were always aware that if you're going to have good collegial relationships and good adult learning and setting, you have to set aside time for it, Yeah, which is why we set aside morning meetings, why there are five or six days during the year when the kids don't come to school and the teachers do. And you have to have some ideas about how to fill that time, not with administrative uh, trivia, That's right. but with engaging teachers in co-designing the agenda for those sessions and providing protocols for conversation that are safe and structured uh, where everyone gets a chance to participate. So time and protocols for us have been very important. The other piece, Caleb, you just touched on it, was uh, the notion of peer observation. And we've had times that, but during which various of our schools have really tackled the notion of peer observation and in their morning meetings have talked about and had sessions about what 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 are some good mindsets for observation uh, yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah. how do we how do we respond to a colleague's work when they're in their classroom and so forth what constitutes a helpful response how can we get good um, at responding to each other's work um, and stuff like that. So peer observation, I think, is a really, really critical piece of the work. There was just maybe one more example. I would love to kind of like just give a concrete example of like some of that unbottlenecking. Um, there were a couple of teachers um, who had a, what I thought was a, a brilliant idea about how to connect newer teachers with more veteran teachers. Um, and some of the veteran teachers would be invited to share like a single practice that they use that they find to be powerful lever for either rich work or, or deep dialogue. And these two teachers, they invited Mark Aguirre when Mark was oh. with us. And if you know Mark Aguirre, you know exactly what's coming next, Socratic seminar. So what the two veteran teachers did was they say, yo, Caleb, what if we hosted a small gathering of say five to six teachers, maybe like once a month at a local place here in Liberty Station for dinner. And in the course of having dinner, they might be able to hear from a veteran teacher like Mark Aguirre about the practice of Socratic seminar. Uh, what it is, how he started, where it is now, why he does this particular practice, uh, and what he sees as the impact of that work and what's the evidence of that. And my job was like not to be there, actually. <laughs> my job was just to kind of just come in, just give a little salute and get out of the way. And every now and then I'll bring a bottle of, of red wine. But then I would leave. And through those conversations, newer teachers had an opportunity to access 
deep funds of, of like trade craft with teachers who've honed a particular practice. And that sort of, we call them salons, and these sort of evening salons with dinner, sometimes with music, would have veterans and newer teachers learning together in some very, very powerful ways in a sort of peer-to-peer -peer structure. And it was, it was marvelous. Sounds like fun, Caleb. Oh, yeah, it was fun. I, I wanted to hang out a little bit more so I could pick up some tips. <laughs> but, like, I knew my job was, like, not to be there. And uh, it, was, it was very inspiring work. And I think right back to uh, the notion of symmetry, uh, these notions of peer observation, learning from peers and stuff like that. Uh, this is stuff that we want our kids to be doing as well, yeah. engaging in peer critique, engaging in collaborative design together, and connecting with the world together, learning from and about each other as they go along. I would love to, maybe in, a, in, a, in, a, maybe in another episode, really have a... I'm, I'm reminded about the Jeff Duncan Andrade School, Roses in the Concrete. And while they were not necessarily a, a project-based school, they were absolutely a dialogical school. And so I think for us, we, we tend to lead with, you know, learning through a project and connect that to dialogue. So I would love to, like, have a sort of conversation about the relationship between these two things in maybe some other episode. I think you just gave a trailer for the next episode. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would love uh, to um, spend some time discussing projects next time. Project, Caleb, projects that you've engaged in or have seen that have been particularly uh, inspiring and, and the, role of, the role of dialogue in those projects. And I've got a few I would want to talk about as well, obviously. Let's talk about projects. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Watch this space, everybody. Okay. It's coming. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. Hey, thank okay. you all so much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. So much more to say. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Always. High Tech High Unboxed is hosted and edited by me, Alec Patton. Our theme music is by Brother Herschel. Huge thanks to Rob and Caleb for sharing their wisdom. We've got lots of good links in the show notes. We're going to be back with another Fireside Chat next month. If you have questions you'd like me to ask Rob and Caleb in that episode, send them to unboxed at hthgsc.edu. Thanks for listening.